Gatta? Here. Councillor Watson? Here. Representative Clucci? Here. And Representative Elia? Thank you. Uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there reports or correspondence from councillors? Councillor Roberts. Madam Chairwoman, I would just like to commend the uh, Cape Elizabeth Lions Club. Uh, they put on a benefit uh, lobster or chowder dinner for the Megan Yates, whose father passed away in the accident. And they did a tremendous job on that benefit. And it was well attended by uh, the community in, in, in whole. And uh, I'm usually touting the Rotary Club, so now I, I get a chance to Mention what a great job the Lions did, so kudos to them. Thank you. Councillor swift -Pata. Um Madam Chair, I also would like to uh, make some commendations. The Public Works Open House was on January 27th, and I would, um, it, they had a good turnout at the Open House, and I just wanted to express my appreciation to everyone who worked on that project, especially the people at Public Works. It's a beautiful building, and I think the town will be well served by this new facility. Secondly, I wanted to mention, everybody probably knows, but in case you don't, 911 is in operation now as of a few weeks ago. So um, anyone who has an emergency can call 911 uh, and get the appropriate emergency personnel. And lastly, I wanted to mention that over the past month, I've, been, uh, att I've attended several meetings on the topic of the upcoming municipal budget. Um, I would. Uh, like to draw everyone's attention to the fact that it is bu budget season. The council and, and the school board, too, will be going through their own budgets. Um, um, I've met with Mike McGovern several times, also with Kevin Sweeney of the school board, and with Tom Forsella, just to make sure we're well aware of what's going on with each other's, each other's budgets. And I think that Kevin Sweeney is going to get up in a few minutes and just give us a, a, a brief overview of what's going on. But I just want to let the public know that we're working very hard on the budgets, but um, it's going to be a difficult season for budgets this year. Um, there was an article in the paper a couple of weeks ago outlining the fact that uh, state revenues and excise taxes are down for towns and that um, the school board and the school department is facing some pressure from a de proposed decrease in state subsidy. Uh, this is affecting 90-something communities in the state, and I know the school board and the superintendent are working on that, but it is going to have an impact on their budget, which in turn has an impact on the town. So anybody has any questions about it, I'm sure can call uh, Kevin Sweeney or Tom Forsella about the school's plans. They can call me as head of the finance committee for the town council. And I'm sure Mike McGovern, who is out of town at the moment, but I'm sure when he gets back, he'd be willing to address questions too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Councillor Watson. Madam Chair, I just wanted to mention that I attended the first uh, meeting of the Legislative Policy Committee of the Maine Municipal Association on January 25th. It was the first uh, meeting of this um, membership for the new biennial um, budget and for the 120th legislature. And a subject of concern was the um, general purpose aid to education funding. And I'm, I won't go into it too much because I'm sure Kevin um, Sweeney is going to speak to some of that. But it was the uh, consensus of the membership of the Legislative Policy Committee that we not support the governor's budget proposal for his GPA funding, which was 5% for this coming year and 3% in the next year. The Legislative Policy Committee believes that um, the governor should increase that, that part of the budget to at least 6%, the same as last year, to kind of hold us in the same position. And we are taking that position with the governor and in front of all of the legislature. That is going to be the position of the LPC of the Maine Municipal Association. And that was probably one of the, the strongest votes that we had among that membership is of great concern is what's going to impact each municipality's budget with a reduction in the um, GPA funding. So um, not that I I'm, I'm, will have a lot of clout or merit, but that is the position of the LPC. It's a position that I took as well. And um, a lot of other uh, things are on the agenda. Lots of bills before the legislature, 
for the, this next coming year. Um, and I'll be watching them very closely as um, Cape Elizabeth's representative and will report back accordingly. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. I have uh, just a couple of items. As you know, the city manager is out of town, and so he did give us a brief report. I just wanted to make a couple of things. Councilor swift Gatto has already spoken about the 911, um, enhanced 911, which is now open and running. And if you really want to see something interesting, it's worth going over the dispatching center to see how that works. And that we would like to welcome, as a town, welcome our new uh, assessor who came on board February 5th, Matt Sturgis. Um, I won't comment on the public works opening because Councillor Swift Kayata, acting as the city manager apparently, is <laughs> reading this. Um, also, we have uh, put our bonds out for this year, and our financial condition was reviewed both by Moody's Investor Service and by Stanford, uh, Stanford Poor, and um, that uh, we again have a AAA rating, which is, uh, continues to make us proud in Cape Elizabeth. Um, we want to congratulate the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust, who has completed the purchase of the Robinson Woods property on uh, Shore Road. And um, for those who, who may not have read about this, I can certainly speak from having lived in this town for many years that over the years people have always said, oh, they like Cape Elizabeth has because it has, they, they like the rural appearance of Cape Elizabeth. But, you know, we always say to ourselves, well, what does that mean? What is a rural, what does that mean? But what it really means is if it doesn't have any structures on it, people consider it rural. So when you drive by that piece of land, that's a terrific piece of land for this community to own. And it will, of course, provide great trail service and, and, and hiking for citizens of this town. So that's all I'm going to say. That would have been the town manager's report. Um, now we are going to have some, uh, is there any discussion of items not on the agenda by citizens that are here tonight? We'll move to Mr. Sweeney. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kevin Sweeney. I'm Kevin, I want to make sure that you can be heard because this is, is really important for the public. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's the know. whole point of this. So I didn't see the camera turn, but it's turned now. Okay. Yes, good evening. My name is Kevin Sweeney. I'm here tonight in my official capacity as finance chair of the school board of Cape Elizabeth. Regrettably, to bring you some information that none of us want to hear. I'll keep my comments as brief as possible, but I do need to go back over a little bit of history for you. When we met, met back on January 23rd in a joint meeting between the town council and the school board, one of the items which the governor was loudly touting at the time was the fact that he was supporting a 5% increase in general purpose aid to schools. And you may recall at that dinner meeting that I cautioned everyone at that meeting that perhaps this was not good news for Cape Elizabeth. Unfortunately, my prediction was more than correct. More than correct to the tune of nearly $400,000, which will be reduced, which is currently proposed to be reduced from our overall budget. And I think we all recognize the impact of that. If we look at the Cape Elizabeth School Department budget, more than 75% of that budget alone relates to salaries and benefits. There are items like debt service. There are items like special education mandates, all of which the school board really has no control over. Once those items are agreed to, that's it. The amount of the budget over which we do have any significant control is really very small. So a $400,000 cut in GPA potentially means that that is the one area where we have any opportunity, uh, possibly, to cut the budget. And that would come in the forms of books and pens and pencils and crayons and chalk, lab supplies, et cetera, et cetera. This is just reprehensible. This is my fourth year as an elected member of the school board, and this is the fourth year we are confronting the threat of budget cuts because of a reduction in general purpose aid to schools. Invariably, it takes our attention away from trying to bring this school district and this town to a level of national excellence and puts us in a position to wonder 
how can we keep what we already have? There is a seriously flawed formula that is used that relates to property values, et cetera, et cetera. And we are not in this boat by ourselves. As Council Swift Kayata mentioned, there are 98 other school districts that will be losing money. However, curiously, none of the governor's announcements mentioned the fact that while there would be a 5% increase in GPA, and in fact there is, that 99 school districts would lose a huge amount of money. In the past, we have sat back with the uh, hold harmless clause, breathed a sigh of relief as in the waning days of the budget process, our funding was restored or partially restored and went on with business. We can no longer afford to do that. This will haunt us every year. And every year, the reality of a cut, <coughs> we get closer and closer. Therefore, Tom Fuseller and I have already been in touch, and other members of the uh, school board have already been in touch with our elected legislators. legislators. We have also been in touch with surrounding district superintendents, my opposite numbers in, in surrounding districts. One of the things that has happened is the formation of a group that I believe is called the Coastal Superintendents uh, Coalition, which is a beginning. The purpose of that is to bring together superintendents and school board members and town councilors and state elected officials, as well as the public, to begin to fight this on a regular basis. In any event, I did want to bring this to your attention. It is too big a matter to let ride until our next formal meeting. And to make you aware, I would also like to take this opportunity to call the community to action and ask that you write to your legislators and express your concerns over the constant threats to the educational quality in Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Like Councillor Swift I had spoken earlier with Kevin. Is there anybody who wanted to ask any questions? I know that I, we're, this is an opportunity for Kevin to bring this to the public. So, Councillor Roberts. Yeah, Councillor. Uh, Kevin, the people writing probably should write as well to Governor King, because I, I know our own representatives are tra doing their best to make sure that this doesn't happen. I think the governor himself needs to hear that kind of. Uh, feedback from the people, and not just from Cape Elizabeth, but all these towns are affected. Well, that, that, is, that is our hope, because Cape Elizabeth by itself will not be heard, <laughs> and Yarmouth by itself will not be heard, and perhaps even Portland by itself will not be heard, but when we begin to, if, if we can find the 99 districts that are losing, and the state is very reluctant to tell us who those other districts are, it's clear that we can pull those legislative groups together and make a, uh, a much firmer case for doing something about this seriously forward form formula. Is, is that true that the state will not say which towns were negatively impacted by this they formula? Will make, they are making it very difficult. We have requested <laughs> names of the 99 districts and how much they are losing. They will not give it to us. They will deal with us on a on an individual um, district by district basis. If we ask about a specific district, they will tell us about a specific district. I have to assume they don't want us to find out, and I want to assure the residents that we will find out. <laughs> Madam Chair? Yes, yes Councilor Watson. A suggestion to um, uh, Finance Chair Sweeney is that um, you might get in touch with the Maine Municipal Association because that's, this is on the forefront of all those members' brains. You know, many of them are town managers as well as counselors um, that sit on that board. And if you can't get it from the state, go through Maine Municipal Association and they send a uh, broadcast email asking for people to get back to you who are looking at substantial shortfalls. Thank you. That's and, good advice. And I can tell you that you'll probably get a barrage of responses because there are many people up there that are very concerned about this. And I would, in fact, I would go there um, before I wasted too much more time at the state level and see if MMA can give us a hand, hand with that. We're, we're to assume that this uh, reduction 
in school funding is probably not hitting any of the northern communities that is the southern communities in the state that we're... Well, I can tell you that it's our understanding, and of course we have been unable to confirm it with the state, but it's our understanding that there is a shortfall of $9 million in this increase. That would not increase Cape Elizabeth's um, general purpose aid. It would simply bring us to where we were before mm -hmm. in a hold harmless. The governor has only proposed a $2 million hold harmless. Between Yarmouth, Cape Elizabeth, and <laughs> Portland alone, we eat that right. entire $2 million. Right. Other towns like Freeport are losing huge amounts of money. So that's why we're bringing together the school districts. And we hope to make this, I really do hope that this can be made into a comprehensive effort that we don't forget about, even if the governor does fork over the additional $7 million to make us whole. Mm -hmm. Because we'll be right back here next year doing the same thing. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Finally, if I might, um, yeah. I'd like to reiterate our invitation to the members of the council that uh, Dr. Forcella and our business, our mutual business manager, Pauline P Portia, are prepared to meet with you individually at any time to go over any issues, concerns, or questions you might have regarding the budget, as am I certainly available at any time to all of the councilors and to the residents to answer any questions you might have. Thank, Thank you for you. your time tonight. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, Yes. if I could add for the councillors, um, I passed out for Kevin a few minutes ago uh, the school board's budget meeting dates to remember. They're also apparently on the website mm -hmm. for members of the public who might be interested because those are indeed public meetings, the same as the municipal budget meetings are too. So I just wanted to draw that to a fellow councillor's attention. Fine. Thank you very much. Uh, next on our agenda is the approval of minutes. We have minutes from the December 11th, the January 8th, and the January 10th uh, meeting. Those minutes are in your packet. Are there any errors or omissions? Very none. I'll entertain a motion for approval. So moved. I move that they all be approved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Opposed none. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> item number 69. Action to refer a citizen petition to amend the zoning ordinance to the planning board. Petition requests and amendments to Article 6, Section 19-6-5C, which would provide that effective January 1, 2001, no conditional use and permitted non-resonal use may be simultaneously occur on a single parcel of land within the business district A. Um, I'd like to say to the council, I see that there are a lot of people here that uh, probably are here for that particular item. This is not a public hearing. <laughs> I'm sorry to say our agenda clearly states that we're going to move it on to the um, planning board. I wanted to see that the council in their packet, there is um, an excerpt from two or three pages of our zoning ordinance. And just so that you can see before we move that on, um, what other areas of the town this uh, proposed ordinance will impact so you can see that on page, that it's page, uh, article uh, six <coughs> from page 90 and page 91 of our zoning ordinance. So um, that is that. Now I, I, I will ask if there are counselor, we have a counselor that wants a question. I don't know who to direct the question to because I don't want eight people to answer. He wants to ask a question. So counselor Robert. <laughs> Thank you. The, actually, the question was more a comment here. It wasn't anybody's specific. Did you want to ask the question directly? No. Oh, I'm sorry. It was more concerned than a oh. question just to the oh, council okay. itself. The, uh, this ordinance appears to me to be one addressed primarily towards uh, the gas station on Shore Road. But I was concerned when reading it that what Im impact it might have on the other properties and other businesses in town as well. And I did not notice Bothell's on here. I don't know if they should be or not. not I want to be sure that every organization or business that could be adversely <clears throat> impacted by this is notified. Mm -hmm. um, and, I th they, and I want to make sure the planning board involves them in anything that they do as far as taking a look at this. I think that, I think that will happen. And um, it is... It's their standard policy. Right. Yeah. It, it will happen. Councilor Swift-Kayata. Um, 
Madam Chair, I, this is a point of information I wanted to ask mm -hmm. about. In the cover memo from uh, Mr. McGovern, mm -hmm. in the first paragraph, and perhaps the town clerk could check on this one when he returned, but in the cover memo it says this proposal would prohibit properties in the BA zone from having a conditional use and a non-permitted use on the same parcel. That's true. Well, from reading the um, petition, what the petition says is no conditional use and permitted non-residential use. Um, so I, I think there may be a misprint. I'm sure it's just a misprint. Oh, in the first paragraph, maybe? In the first paragraph. I, I, I think what the petition is requesting is the prohibition of a conditional use and a permitted non-residential use. That's right. As opposed to a conditional use and a non-permitted use. There's a third category. I think, I think the cover memo's just got the categories mixed up. So if the town clerk could just mm -hmm. okay. correct that, because I think mm -hmm. it could lead to some confusion the paper tra if the paper trail is incorrect okay. following, going along to the um, planning board. Okay. So that's just an informational correction I think needs to be made in the cover memo. All right, we'll check that out before we send the memo on Thank to the you. planning board. So, I will entertain a motion to send this to the planning board. Madam Chair, yes. before you do that, I have a question. Uh -huh. um, I don't know if there's anyone here to speak to this tonight, and this certainly is something that we can look into as it goes before the planning board, but I had two concerns in, in the town manager's memo, concern about the impact of um, sending this to the planning board an impact on our own fire station lot mm -hmm. on Shore Road and what the what specifically the implications of that of if this passed would be and also specifically what the implications would be uh, for um, Gil Jordan's uh, Jordan's farm market it does have implications for it him. does have implications but I was wondering if there's somebody and I don't know if I don't see anyone here Maureen's not here that could address those issues of what exactly they're referring to I mean, what well, it, it, passing this on to the planning board? No, it, it clearly. If you look at the, if you look at uh, page 90, the excerpt from your right. zoning board, you look at page 90. Right. You see where it says item three, the following non-residential uses. Right. Those are them. And if you go to the next page, under item C. Right. Oh wait a minute, is that it? Is that where they say the daycare facility and yeah. the gas station repair? Yep. Yeah. You can't have one from one list and one from the other list on the same piece of property. Right. About the simplest way to explain it. So. Right, right. You can't have one from the conditional list, right. one from the from. permitted non-residential list. But aren't those, hopefully those are things the planning that board. the planning board, well, yes, not hopefully, they this. will address those things. I think that's what Town you're, you're like saying. To say something about I'd just like to comment regarding the Engine 1 mm. station that you had brought up yeah. and potentially other businesses. Um, since the letter went out to the town manager, several business owners have been into town hall to see what the impact may or may not be to their businesses. And again, I think keeping in mind that this is, this is a citizen petition and we are trying to our best um, point out to people what we believe the intent is to be and so forth. Right. Specifically to Engine 1, we had a department head meeting today and Chief um, McGuldrick asked the same question um, to the town planner. As this has been proposed, what will the potential implications be, right. um, et cetera? And um, the chief was strongly encouraged to look over the ordinance, to talk more with the planner, and as, as any member of the public is welcome, that we would also submit to the planning board and throughout the process potential questions and concerns, et cetera, because, again, being a municipal facility, we may, may or may not, uh, in fact, um, be affected as well. So the chief right. is pursuing that. And, okay. Um, we did talk about that early this morning. Okay. I think we'll have an opportunity to look further into it when the planning board also begins to do their uh, looking into it to see what the impact of this is. But it is our responsibility this evening to simply send it to the planning board at this time. We'll probably have to have a workshop with the planning board maybe to get into this a little bit more. So I'll entertain a motion to do that. Is there a motion on the floor? No. I'd, I'd like to move. Uh, that we refer this item to the planning board and we ask the planning board to <coughs> excuse me return it to the council no later than october 1st 2001. I second that motion. okay it's been moved and seconded is there any further discussion all those in favor opposed none thank you and thank you for coming i, I this this was a procedural evening for us um, item number 70, action upon recommended board and commission appointments.
Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. The Appointments Committee met uh, this past month to uh, fill the vacancy on the Riverside Cemetery Committee. And I'm looking for my note here. And we had two very good candidates. The candidate we selected was Beverly Brooking. Uh, Ms. Brookings has uh, a number of years' experience working with cemeteries, and we feel she will be an excellent uh, member of that board. So we are recommending Beverly Brooking for the uh, cemetery committee. Thank you. I'll move appointment. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded. We appoint Beverly Brooking to the cemetery trustees. Mm -hmm. yes. oh, yeah. Do we think the 20 years experience working at the yeah. side is enough? Or it's enough. <laughs> All those in favor? You can learn on the job. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Opposed, done. Thank you very much. Um, item number 71, action to authorize application to the planning board for landscaping improvements upon and adjacent to the Portland Headlight property. And uh, Tom Emery is here to give us a little uh, explanation. And I, I would like to encourage the councillors at this time before we, that it's oftentimes hard to see, and this is the presentation to the council. So if you want to go down and look at what he's pointing to and look at what, it, this is the time to do that now, before, you know, so that you can raise any issues before it goes there. And I'm sure Tom can answer them. And Cheryl is here also. Our, um, either one. Uh, We can see it. I don't know if the camera can see it, but I don't think the camera could see it anyway. Well, he does it's zoom in, to... but I. It's easy to get the dogs out of here. It's a whole new huh. no, don't talk about dogs. <laughs> a whole new issue. <laughs> I vote for it. I think it looks beautiful already. <laughs> you need bigger pictures, Tom. <laughs> we need better eyesight. <laughs> better eyesight. Um, yes, definitely. Or a telescope. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Chairman and uh, town councilors. Uh, we are about to uh, submit the uh, proposed landscape improvements projects to the planning board. Uh, as part of the uh, design process, we've had a site walk with the Fort Williams Commission. We have prepared a questionnaire for all of the commission members, which uh, has been filled out, which sets forth their goals of the project and uh, long-term views of the project area. I think initially what I'd like to say, this is uh, personally a long uh, ongoing process for me, uh, having started with the Fort Williams Master Plan back in the early 90s, and it's truly a privilege to be involved uh, with this project. Uh, when I went out to the site last October, among other days, it was a very busy uh, leaf peeper weekend, and not only did I see many people that clearly are not town residents, I had the opportunity to hear accents from all over the world. I saw people with all different uh, levels of ability accessing uh, the improvements that have been made over many years and enjoying the, the headlight and the cliff walk trail particularly. Uh, we've divided the project into several sub areas and I'm sure the council will be interested um, and I'm not sure what you have in your packet with respect to the budget but uh, we are under the direction of about a $90,000 budget which is determined from fundraising uh, and my understanding is that none of it is coming out of uh, town's tax uh, dollars as such. Um, we have identified several sub areas, but the overall uh, goals of this project are to improve pedestrian safety and convenience. Uh, the, the main issue of that is that people coming from that central parking lot that serves the soccer fields or the ball fields and the headlight, uh, which is not immediately adjacent to the headlight, tend to walk down the road and then either head over toward the cliff walk or inevitably get involved in the main entrance driveway. The minute they see the beacon, it's like lemming, lemmings headed toward the ocean, and they, they will stop anywhere to take pictures. And it, it's sort of like, I suppose, approaching the Parthenon. 
for the first time. It, <laughs> your, your heart uh, speeds and, and you just can't believe that you're seeing something that you've only seen in history books for so long. So there's that sense of confusion and wonderment and so forth that uh, I'm not sure we can design for, but we can do as much as possible in order to discourage that, that sort of uh, safety issue. The other issue is that as you walk around, there are many areas that are eroded, the edges along the fence lines, there are areas where there's just not enough width of walkway to accommodate even the average daily use, let alone what I used to refer to as the Easter weekend or the busiest days of, of any season. <coughs> and then lastly, and probably least importantly, uh, are some miscellaneous landscape uh, enhancements and improvements. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that after having showed many options to the Fort Williams Commission, our direction was to make whatever we do look like it was always part of the fort and has always been there. And uh, to put it in the vernacular, uh, since the very beginning of, of uh, our work at Fort Williams, one of the goals has always been just don't mess it up. I mean, it's, if you don't do anything, it's wonderful. Anything you can do to enhance, enhance it, be sure that it is indeed an enhancement. The focus of the project will be uh, to provide a wider sidewalk or walkway, much like the Cliff Walk Trail in character, extending from this area, which is Battery Blair. This is the main entrance drive here for driveway. This is the drop off, and here is the headlight of the lighthouse. What the Commission would like us to do is provide a convenient access from Battery Blair. There's already a sidewalk from the central parking lot that extends down to Battery Blair. But from that point, head south of the main parking lot drop-off area. Uh, there will continue to be a crosswalk uh, where there is now going to be shifting it slightly closer to the uh, headlight for safety purposes. Uh, but the goal is we're going to make that walk about 10 to 12 feet wide uh, so that once people are on it heading from the, the lighthouse, they'll be encouraged to stay on it given the width. And there'll be miscellaneous landscape improvements, some minor mounting on each side, so it'll be a very gentle uh, rolling Tom, how far down would that walkway go to go all the way down? Or are you about to explain that? Okay. Here again is the battery flare. The green area is just to give you a little bit of emphasis on, on the areas we're discussing. But the walkway will go all the way from the central parking lot, which is now about five or seven feet wide. That will be an increase to 10 feet. It will be about 10 feet wide until we get just past battery flare at the bottom of that hill. And then from that point, it will be wide to 10 and 12 feet. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but as you approach the headlight of the pine tree on the right, it was intended to be very sort of horizontal looking and so forth, but the only pine available is the pine of the Austrian pine or the flat pine or Japanese pine, so that, that's going to have to be pruned. But we're going to cut right through behind that pine tree and create a burn on either side of the sidewalk, and then you go around the south side of the existing parking lot with easy access to the binocular and oval here, and then uh, in for the, the headlight itself. That's the main focus of, of the project, and our intent is that when, when that's built, it will look like it's always been there. It'll be the familiar materials uh, that you'll see everywhere else in the park. The plantings will be um, not very formal. They'll be very naturalized and all ocean-loving or seaside-loving plant materials. The other areas that we've been asked to look at and do the design for is an extension of, for future extension along the fence line to the south of the Portland headlight, and then an extension of the, of the walkway up to the toward the cliff walk along that cliff face, which seems to be one of the more popular locations. This is a more detailed area, and here's the headlight, here's the uh, drop-off area. You have a walk, an existing walk, here's the garden ship. We have an existing walk that comes along, and here's the main entrance for the uh, keeper's quarters in the museum. The committee has uh, really, I think, hit on something very uh, welcoming in that there's a fence line in front of the uh, keeper's quarters of the museum that really doesn't need to be there anymore. It's all owned by the town. We're proposing to remove that fence line and create some additional low-level landscaping here. But 
provided direct access when one leaves the museum. One can turn right along this cliff face and come up and then head toward the cliff walk trail here. This is an existing stone stairway that's sort of half built into the cliff. That will be dismantled and reconstructed for safety purposes. We've heard a number of comments from uh, the commission members who walk their dogs in the morning who have a tendency to miss steps going down over there trying to keep up with their pets. So that, among other things, is a, is a safety concern. We're also going to infill with additional landscaping to match what's here so that there's a clear separation between the volunteer parking lot and this large gravel area. And that large gravel area will be made, uh, again, will be revegetated, so it'll, it'll just uh, be more naturalized and less expansive. One issue that we've been asked to uh, address, however, is the need for emergency access from uh, that parking area up toward that cliff face. That's one of the main points that the fire department has or the wet team has for accessing anything that happens over the cliff. There's a lot of cliff climbers there. So we'll be providing a 16 foot wide gravel area that will be a little bit irregular, but it's the same material that's here now. There won't be any formal paving or anything like that. Yeah, for vehicles? Excuse me? For vehicles? For emergency vehicles yeah, only. Emergency vehicles. Yeah. Could I ask a question on the, the, the crosswalk there, Tom? The, the, um, the 10 feet you're going to put around uh, the, toward the bottom. Um, that's but, that's, yeah, the, the that's excellent. And, and then it, it, there's a place where you walk right across the, uh, the driving area there. Could, could that be uh, eliminated and go around to the right instead of having to walk across through traffic? I think he means back up towards uh, Towards the battery, battery Blair? Yeah, yeah, right. You're talking about the existing crosswalk. Yes. Mm. Yeah, the existing crosswalk uh, is located uh, here's Battery Blair, and here's the, the hill that you come down. And the existing R crosswalk is right at the bottom of that hill. Right. What we're proposing to do is we had two options that we discussed with the, with the commission, and one was to move it to the left, let's say, or yeah. farther away from the lighthouse. Yeah. And I was concerned that if we did that, that a lot of people coming from the cliff walk would, would just step off on the street, or people who knew that they wanted to go to the cliff walk who weren't headed toward the lighthouse would get out into the street and sure. create a safety concern. So what we're doing is, is as you come down this, the, what would be a new set of stairs to get away from the, uh, or from the, the battery, oh, yeah. You will turn right, and that, and that, and there'll be a, a fence at that point. Uh, so you'll be directed to the right, and then the crosswalk will occur someplace beyond where you turn right. And at that point, we hope we pull them into the jewelry section of the of the store, and they're off headed toward the lighthouse rather than yeah. being involved in the uh, crosswalk. So they don't have to walk across. The no, they don't. And there's a fence in the way. So that is right. Oh, that's okay. and and there's a lot of discussion about the issue of fencing, and, and we have elected to continue with the fence that's there. There's a thousand fences that might look better, but rather than try to reinvent something and carry it through the rest sure. of the park, we're just going to use what what we have available, and, and it's most cost effective at this point. That's great. Tom, when you're standing in front of the lighthouse and you're looking up toward the hill with the flagpole, mm -hmm. I mean, all over the park, people make paths because once people start walking, they break the growth down. It sure. becomes a path. I don't know how safe it is, but when you're putting your back to the lighthouse and you're looking up to the hill, there's this, of course, path that comes all the way down this dirt path. That's where it's sort of a straight shot. Yeah. Probably causes some erosion. I don't know if there's something that may not be included in this or doesn't it, you know. Uh, I mean, the only thing I would do is just leave it there because people use it, but I would certainly, you know, traverse the slope that way. You're trying to park them directly off the side where the wooden steps are coming up. Uh, right up above the cannon there, you know, yeah. up the hill. They come yeah. across the hill where people fly kites, and then they come straight down yeah, to the headlight, and they just have a dirt, like a cow path comes down there. But if it was, it must be erosion. I would think that just uh, trying to traverse it. I think it. In, the, in the past what they've attempted to do there is by using the fencing at the top of the slope to discourage people from getting down there. And I can't remember. That isn't something well, that we've specifically not, looked at. It's not at, even going to it. Yeah. Not part it's, of it. <laughs> it's being funded by Cheryl anyway, right? <laughs> Yay, Cheryl. <laughs> the area around the lighthouse itself, uh, we're doing some mining, but I think very uh, important improvements. And uh, this is this light area here is the existing uh, asphalt pavement that has a sealer on it, has the Cape Elizabeth approved.
approved seal in the world. Post put on our driveway for October 10th where we're banished to South Portland. Um, what we're doing here is on the north side, there's a lot of uh, foot traffic erosion and compaction along that fence line. We're proposing to place uh, stone that will mimic or be very uh, similar to the stone that's in the fort already. That'll be a flat paver stone, so it's reasonably easy to walk on, but it'll set that edge and define it. And that will vary in width, but uh, typically it will be about three to four feet wide. That will be all along the fence line, and then we will widen the sidewalk here by a couple of feet. Yeah. There's a grass panel in there now that's fairly eroded uh, and brown in several areas. We had thought that we would remove that and replace it with the same treatment we have at the cliff walk so that any, anybody on the north side of the lighthouse could stand anywhere they, they want. There was concern raised that that was just too much for that area, that uh, people enjoyed seeing the green. And I know that it's a bit of a maintenance issue, but uh, what we have elected to do is we're going to widen the asphalt a little bit, we're going to provide the stone edge, and then we're going to put additional topsoil in where the grass is now and sod it and try to reestablish that. We have an option to put in uh, the low chain work which you see up by the entrance of the, uh, and the flower garden, garden club main chains. Uh, if necessary, we could go ahead and, and use a treatment like that in any of the grass panels that we elect to maintain. The other grass panel that we're keeping is on the south side of the lighthouse in this area. Again, there's several attractions here, plus the view to draw people to the edge of the fence. So we'll have a similar treatment as we do on the south side, and then some cliff walk trail treatment, and then a return back to the existing sidewalk. There's also a long fellow bench here that we'll be providing a cliff walk like treatment around that for access into a discouraged erosion. Those are really the, the main components of the project. The only other my component is sort of a uh, shortcut from the path that goes up toward the cliff walk to a, another path that goes over toward the wood stairs to go up to the top of the hill toward the flagpole. We've elected not to do a lot with that. There's some remnants before the cliff walk trail was done. There's these wonderful old, I call goat paths around the park that are nice to discover uh, and aren't highly utilized. This one is probably more utilized than many, but it still isn't necessary to make it into the formal walkway that we have at the, the cliff walk. Let me, uh, I didn't discuss very much of what's happening in the media's Avenue. Avenue Blair, um, we have two, we've looked at three issues. One, if this is a battery, here's the existing uh, stone path or gravel path out toward, and here's the bus drop off area. Right now, there's a very lonely plaque here with one stone that, that uh, everyone feels really needs to be addressed and, and added to. There was also uh, some consideration for adding another path that would tie back in here to the path that goes down toward the lighthouse, and that would be a minimum slope that it would be easily accessible without having to do switchback ramps and handrails. Uh, that's being designated as the future part of the project because people can still get from the battery down this path along the parking and then back down here if they need to. But the more immediate concern is getting from the battery down the slope, which is badly eroded and just laid out across. And rather than just build a standard set of stairs there, we're proposing to do what we're calling ramp steps, where we'll have two, three foot wide treads with a stone face on them. And those treads will probably be, be a similar material as the cliff walk. It'd be nice to think that they could be grass panels, but clearly that wouldn't uh, last very long. And then those will be, uh, this area will be priced as an area. The main focus of the project will be this connecting path. And then we have this area to the south and north and then everything around the lighthouse. So as we complete our cost estimating, we can put together an initial package that will be within the budget uh, constraints. And, but we want to go to the planning board with the entire project so we don't have to go through this every time uh, another small or, say, medium-sized project is proposed in this area. Yes. Dr. again. Timeline on this. I'm glad you asked. Uh, we're looking at March and April planning board uh, meetings. Uh, we're assuming that the initial meeting will be for completeness issues and then will be referred to a public hearing. Uh, we would like to 
bid it this spring and be under construction this spring before the busy time of year. Depending upon how the bidding goes and, and how that phasing works, uh, we certainly don't want to be anywhere near the lighthouse uh, during the summer season, but we could work on the, on the path, which is a significant part of the work, south of the parking lot uh, into early summer season. That's the Barry. Yeah, I just had a question, uh, Tom. Do you expect any uh, difficulty with the Americans, the ADA uh, uh, disabilities? No, I don't. I don't uh, see that really uh, as an issue. We're enhancing uh, access. We're dealing with erosion issues. Um, the park is is reasonably accessible as it is in others. Handicapped parking in the central parking lot with immediate access toward the lighthouse along this path. Right. And we're maintaining two handicapped spaces uh, down in front of the lighthouse. All right. um, for some of the members of the design team who uh, are New England natives but are not as familiar with Fort Williams, uh, we had some discussion regarding that issue of drive-in or drive-up lighthouse. And the commission and Bob Malley have not joked but, but thought and, and discussed at some length this whole issue. It's, it's a rare situation. We truly have a drive-up lighthouse here. And there was a question as whether that was too much intrusion. The easiest thing perhaps to do here would be to take the cars right away from the front of the lighthouse and then open it up to pedestrians. But I remember when we did the improvements in front of the lighthouse, one of the goals was to allow for people with uh, either infirmed uh, friends and relatives or elderly family members to drive them to the lighthouse. They can park in the accessible parking spaces. They can park anywhere they want down there and enjoy the views. You get direct views both to the ocean and then the angled views out over the green and, and toward the ocean. And that's one of the reasons we're maintaining that, that space that faces directly toward the ocean. Uh, it's, it is a little bit intrusive for pedestrians, but the day I was there, I saw it being used uh, very, very nicely. Uh, there was a family from Ohio and they had elderly infirmed uh, uh, people with them and, and sure. they there were two wheelchairs involved, if I remember correctly, so it really served its purpose quite well. Good. Now, I don't know if you recall, but with the Cliff Walk Trail, we have signed that. Uh, it is uh, signed for people with uh, disabilities that are not wheelchair bound. Uh, and one of the goals under the recreational guidelines is not to create measures of accessibility that uh, detract from the natural features that, that one is trying to preserve uh, as part of the overall park project. Thank you, Tom. Is there any other questions before we send this on? Bring none from the council. I appreciate it. It's going to look no wonderful. No questions about my tie? <laughs> and then I noticed the tie. I all, thought all of, all of the issues that need to be addressed as part of this application exist on this tie. Yeah, I, I, I actually <laughs> did notice it, but uh, it's okay. very bright and wonderful. Is it, is it? But no school buses, just buses and trucks. Oh no, I've got school buses, fire trucks, oh. children, and adults, and <laughs> yeah. the whole gamut. Can we have something? No, no, that's, that's the only thing. All right, I have a motion to send this on. I so move. Councilor McGinty. Second. Oh, he moved it, so. Uh, all right. You were just being nice by raising your hand first. Yeah. I tried. Well, I raised my hand. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any more discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, we will send this item on to the planning board. All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing those, Tom. Um, a lot of work. It's going to look wonderful. <coughs> Item number 72, now two items. Uh, this is action to enter into executive session to begin the annual evaluation of the town manager and to discuss a municipal legal matter. Uh, Madam Bob Chair. Chair. <laughs> oh, we have item to come up out of order. We do. Item number 73. We need to have a motion to take an item up out of order. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to take item number 73. Out of order. All those in favor? Opposed none. Thank you. Item number 73, action to change the March regular town council meeting to the Wednesday, March 14th. Uh, we're doing that because two of our councillors will be going to the National League of Cities meetings, and this has happened before. So we'll be moving it from, it's a Monday to a Wednesday? Yes. It just, yeah. From, I, would, I would just add that it's, there's three of us that are three. Going. Three people going. I wish I had something to bring up. The three of you weren't here, but <laughs> I don't. 
<laughs> All right, so we have this uh, on the agenda to move this to March 14th, the regular meeting of the Town Council. So moved. And moved and? Seconded. Seconded. All those in favor? Opposed, none. Thank you very much. Now we can move on to item number 72. Um, how about the citizens' discussion? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. I want to get this moving here. <laughs> Is there any items not on the agenda that citizens would like to discuss? Hearing none, we will move on to item number 72. Action to enter into executive session to begin the annual evaluation of the town manager and to discuss a municipal legal matter. Uh, we will not be making any decisions or taking any votes on either of these two issues, so we will not be coming back into public session as there are no further items on the agenda. Um, so I will ask. So move. Second. Let's move. To go into executive session. It's been moved to begin seconded. the annual go. evaluation of the town meeting. Go into an executive session. <coughs> I second it, please. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed, none. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, and good evening, citizens of Cape Elizabeth.